So last week, we began a short series in the book of Ephesians because we had just returned from Ireland with an emphasis on understanding mission and ministry there and focused on reconciliation. And so for me to emphasize that topic, I went to the book that I thought was one of the best in understanding who we are to be agents of reconciliation, and that was the book of Ephesians. Now last week we looked in the very first chapter and we understood how Paul was gathering together these thoughts of not only prayerful thankfulness, but to understand better who is he writing to. Now Ephesus was a very large city at that time. It was about a half million strong, only second to Rome in terms of population. But because Paul is not writing a specific problem or a specific heresy, as he does in Romans and Colossians, most scholars think that this letter, even though it's titled to Ephesians, was what's called a circular letter. And so it would have been sent to Ephesus, but it was to be used in any church around the area. You might remember from Acts 19 that Paul was in Ephesus for two years, and he used it as his base of ministry, and so he went out evangelizing all through Asia Minor. And we, we see that very obviously even in the book of Revelation, in chapter 2 and 3, where you have the seven letters. These are all tangents that you could have seen as a base from Ephesus. Now, Ephesus, just to understand a little bit more about this city was, um, a, it was a great Greek city right there at the time with access to the sea, but it became a wonderful Roman city and had an amphitheater that could hold 25,000 people, as well as it had one of the seven wonders of the ancient world in the temple of Artemis or the temple of Diana. So here's a very prominent city, huge city. And there's this new cluster of new Christians. And that's who Paul's writing to. So I pulled out just a very short text, hoping that you'll want to read more on your own, particularly focusing in chapter two. But I'm just pulling out about four verses that really hone in on reconciliation. So listen to God's word to you. For Christ himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away, and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Lord, it's always a joy for us to open your word, both as individuals and as a community of faith. We pray for the inspiring of your spirit to understand better this word, the truth therein, and how to apply it in our lives. As individuals and as a community of faith, your church, Highland, may each of us be reconcilers for the cause of Christ. Amen. All right, I'm going to compare your technological savvy to the 11 o'clock, and we're going to see who wins. So I'm going to say a name, 
and you're going to tell me the first word that comes to your mind. I'm going to say the name of a person, and now what do you think of? The late Steve Jobs. Apple. How about Mark Zuckerberg? Good. No more answers, Howard. You're, you're doing it for everybody, okay? How about Jeff Bezos? What? Is it Bezos or Bezos? Bezos. Amazon, right? Okay. How about William Gates? Microsoft. How many said the richest men in the world? How many said for 16 of the 21 years that it's been measured by Forbes, the richest man in the world. That's amazing. But while all of us, he's same born a few months after I was born in 1955, and we're all out playing football and baseball, he's in his garage playing with computers, right? How about the name Tim Berners-Lee? Did you hear him? Anyone else know that? Sir Tim Berners-Lee, actually, from Great Britain, is given full credit, unlike Al Gore, for inventing the internet. In 1989. That's not too long ago, was it? He currently has more degrees than you can write on a piece of paper, continues to work the cause. It says, currently working to ensure the World Wide Web, WWW, is made freely available to all and that it serves humanity by establishing it as a global public good and a basic right. In 2012, he played a starring role in the opening ceremony of the Olympics held in London, where in front of an audience of 900 million people, he tweeted, this is for everyone. Tim Berner-Lee. With all five of these and many others which we could have listed, they all have in common something that they tried, they changed the world in incalculable proportions. They've also changed your life and my life in ways that you and I could never have imagined, have imagined when we were growing up. At least a part of what each one of them was attempting to do in one way or another through this technical advancement was unity. All these, all have provided means which in many ways brings people closer together through nearly instant communication and virtually inexhaustible information. The problem is Despite these unprecedented inventions in these past 45 years, which are supposed to bring us closer together, connecting us through digitized voice and touch screen, there is as much alienation, isolation, and hostility today as ever before. Take, for example, that unfortunately, Ferguson, Missouri made it again into the national news last week on the one year anniversary. Not a day goes by that you and I don't see something in the newspaper about hostility or alienation between individual peoples or between nations. The more I spoke about and shared our experience about Ireland and how we really couldn't understand the more recent problems of the last couple hundred years, or that those problems actually went back over a thousand years, people started saying, wow, things haven't changed much, have they? We're still bothered by the very same issues. 
In today's world, sociologists are now saying that modern alienation is caused by too much reliance on technology. Now, this is not a rant against technology. I enjoy Facebook, and almost a hundred of you are friends on Facebook, and I enjoy keeping up with many of your activities. But I was interested when I read that Sherry Turkle, a professor of MIT, believes that social media can isolate us and even cause us harm. She's written a book, I love the title, Alone Together, Why We Expect More From Technology and Less From Each Other. And in it she talks about how we have so many different kinds of opportunities to communicate using emails or text or instant messages or Facebook or Twitter or phone calls or Skype or you name it, whatever. But she also says that such, high, such light speed communications is great for making links with one another, for, for keeping up with one another which is a good thing. But unfortunately, as we get bombarded by these messages and we start scanning through them faster and faster for lack of time to read them in any depth if they don't have a captivating picture to catch our attention, she says that we make hurried responses and the content of our conversation gets dumbed down. Conversations with depth and meaning the kind of thing that connects us as humans often gets lost. We find ourselves linked by technology, but sometimes we also, as a consequence, feel alienated. <clears throat> sometimes estranged from each other, or worse yet, estranged from God. Now, now see if you know what I'm talking about here. I think many of you have experienced this in one way or another. Even with hundreds of friends at your beck and call with just a touch of your finger on your smartphone, you can be sitting in your chair as alone and lonely as you've ever felt in your life. Have you ever felt that kind of alienation? cut off, isolated, while all the time your smartphone or your computer is right next to you. I wonder if the Ephesians felt that way 2,000 years before the internet was invented. Paul wrote to this group in this huge Roman city, a very small isolated group, of Gentiles and Jews who are trying to figure out how to get to um, get along together themselves and even within this city and it seems like they must have resonated with this alienation because he writes in verse 12 right before our reading he says <clears throat> they were once without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Do you know that without God word in Greek is the only time it's used in the New Testament, in the Bible? And it's the root word that we have for atheist, without God. Can you imagine a more miserable situation of one who has no hope and one who feels isolated from God? And yet, that's how he's describing how they used to be living in Ephesus. What did it feel like to be a Gentile in Ephesus? I don't know. Archaeology only tells us so much about life in this, um, what is current day Turkey, in this sun-baked coast of Asia Minor. But as we read this letter to the Ephesians, we can imagine 
what they're going through, this feeling of, of hopelessness or cut off from God. And Paul says that they felt like aliens, which is the root word for alienation. And this kind of alienation, this feeling of being removed, withdrawn or estranged from a community, sometimes we, as, as we said, we even feel estranged from God. I'm sure that all of us have been in that situation because statistics will say that today there is a higher percentage of people who claim to be lonely than ever before in our world. Loneliness. Paul tells these Christians that their alienation is over. In verse 13, he says, Now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Paul spends the, the first two chapters here explaining how through the death of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and restored to right relationship with God and with our neighbors. We are reconciled to God through his gift to us of grace. All of you probably know that verse, Ephesians 2, 8. For we, it's for by grace that you have been saved, not by works. He talks about this theology of who we are, but what I wanted to emphasize today was the result of who we are by where he goes into the acts of reconciliation. In this text that we just read together, it's probably the most succinct group of verses I know about to help us understand who were we, who did God create us to be, and who are we supposed to be like in Jesus Christ's reconciliation. Because we are brought near to God through the blood of Christ, and what that means is his crucifixion, as you know, Paul declares that it is through Jesus that we receive peace. In verse 14, he himself is our peace. Jesus Christ is our peacemaker and our wall breaker. Together we stand at the foot of the cross and Jesus has destroyed any barriers. The, what, whatever walls divide us, whatever separates us, the racism, the elitism, the exclusivity, the entitlements, the inequality in God's sight. God in Jesus Christ is our peacemaker, our wall breaker. And Paul goes on to say, in his flesh he has made both groups into one. Christ makes peace between the, the Gentile Christian and the Jewish Christian in Ephesus, between the black American and the white American, between the Protestant and the Catholic in Ireland, between the immigrants and the native born, breaking down the dividing wall that is, it says, the hostility between us. Now it says his purpose the reason Jesus Christ came to earth, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity. Now We could talk a long time about what does that mean, one new humanity out of these two, thus making peace. So, so that we can say that Jesus abolished this old way of life, one that is filled with hostility between peoples, and in a modern parallel, you could almost say that Jesus was the co-founder with the world wide web of spiritual unity. Spiritual connectivity to break down all barriers and obstacles and to unite people unto himself. He began a new way of life, of reconciling both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So you can see here, there's a lot of talk about reconciliation, there's a lot of talk about hostility, and then there's this bridge 
that breaks these things down and brings us together. And that bridge is the cross through his blood. The cross becomes a symbol of connectedness for us. Our otherworldly spiritual connectedness with God, our Creator, and our worldwide connectedness with everyone else. This sacrifice that Jesus made is, was meant to bring us together. It serves as his victory, and we claim it as our victory as well. So through Christ, it says, those who are far off and separated by sin have been brought near and united through forgiveness. So he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. What this means is that Jesus opened a door for us. I guess in modern language you would say it was a portal. It was a portal for us to go through having access to God. For through Him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Think about it. No technology needed. You and I have access to Almighty God. And then what He does is He talks about this concept of access and He talks about how we have access through God, through Jesus Christ, but we also have access in this church that has been created for the purpose of reconciliation. He says it more clearly in the next chapter because he talks about how we were put here in him for his glory in the church and in Jesus Christ for all generations. Glory be to God. Paul's so excited about this, the concept of the church being the agent of reconciliation, that he drops to his knees in chapter 3 and starts praying for this reason, and then he gives one of the sweetest prayers in all the Bible. And right at the end of that prayer, he just jumps right into a doxology and says, praise be to God for this church and for the purpose that it was created. Did you read this week that the Ebenezer Church sang at the Barnstormers game? And they sang for the purpose for the families of the victims in South Carolina. And I thought that church is being used as an agent of reconciliation. So many times I see our own group that we call the Justice, Peace and Reconciliation Committee, team, group of people. And sometimes we say that they're going to do the reconciliation work for us. But in actuality, as you see from this scripture, that's the job of all of us. All of us are to be reconcilers to each other in the name of Jesus Christ through his blood on the cross. So I would leave that challenge to you as to how will you be a reconciler? How will you, as an individual, or how will you help all of us here at Highland reach out and to reconcile others in this world of which we're supposed to be so close together and yet we realize we're still alienated in and through Jesus Christ and his blood. All praise be to our Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful for the opportunity we have to be members of this household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and with Christ Jesus himself as our cornerstone. Lord, join us together. Grow us into a holy temple that everyone will understand that you are our dwelling place and that we are a place of reconciliation. In your name we pray. Amen.